Hi everybody, this is Daniela Caruso at Boston University. Um, I am at the law school and also at the Pardee School of Global Studies where I direct the Center for the Study of Europe. First of all, thanks to uh, Professor Maximo Langer for uh, hosting this event. Uh, it is a pleasure to bring the workings of the center uh, into this uh, phenomenal conference. Thank you so much. Um, so I'm going to proceed with brief introductions, okay? And then we are going to get start, uh, uh, started with the substantive work of the session. But I think the introductions are important because these are people who have worked very hard and I wanted to be clear. <laughs> okay, so um, first, uh, uh, Mitchell Lasser. Uh, in alphabetical order. At Cornell University, uh, Mitchell is the Jack Clark Professor of Law, Director of Graduate Studies, and Co-Director of the Cornell Summer Institute in Paris. He teaches and writes in the areas of comparative law, European Union law, constitutional law, and judicial process. In Europe, Mitch has been a visiting professor at La Sorbonne, at Sciences Po, at the EUI, and much more. In addition to major law review articles, he has published three monographs with OUP. First, Judicial Deliberations, a Comparative Analysis of Judicial Transparency and Legitimacy in 2004. Second, Judicial Transformations. And third, Judicial Disappointments, which is the book he is presenting today to this distinguished audience. Um, our second in alphabetical order, uh, order presenter is Antoine Bochet. At the University of Paris 1, La Sorbonne, uh, Antoine is research professor at the European Center of Sociology and Political Science. He is as well a permanent visiting professor at i -Courts, the Center of Excellence for International Courts in Copenhagen. Over the years, Antoine has engaged in critical sociology of law, historical and political sociology, and no less in the project of democratizing the European Union. In 2015, he authored the monograph Brokering Europe, Euro Lawyers and the Making of a Transnational Polity for Cambridge University Press. In 2019, he co-authored How to Democratize Europe, a Transnational Debate. This volume, volume was published by Harvard University Press. Today, he will tell us about his new book titled The Neoliberal Republic, Corporate Lawyers, Statecraft and the Rise of Public-Private France, Cornell University Press 2020. So our hand-picked discussants, uh, Fernanda Nicola and Queens Lobodian. At American University, Washington College of Law, Fernanda Nicola is professor of law and director of the program International Organizations, Law and Development. Her research interests include European Union law, comparative law, constitutional law and torts. With a PhD from Trento and an SJD from Harvard, where she was awarded the Mancini Prize, Fernanda is like Antoine, also a permanent visiting professor at i -Courts in Copenhagen. In 2017, for Cambridge University Press, she co-edited the volume EU Law Stories, Contextual and Critical Histories of European Jurisprudence. Most recently, she has authored the article Legal Diplomacy in an Age of Authoritarianism, soon to be published by the Columbia Journal of European Law, and is now working at the intersection of comparative law and international organizations in the 21st century. Queen's Lobodian is a historian of modern international history, a professor of history at Wellesley College, and a recent residential fellow at the Weatherhead Initiative on Global History at Harvard University. Queen Slobodian is the author of Globalists, The End of Empire and the Birth of Neoliberalism, published by Harvard University Press in 2018. The book Globalists was awarded the George Louis Beer Prize by the American Historical Association. It has already been translated into German and Turkish with further translations forthcoming in French, Spanish, and Serbian. More recently, he co-edited the volume Nine Lives of Neoliberalism, published in 2020. His recent interests include the capitalism of the far right. Without further ado, Mitch, please talk, uh, talk to us about your book. Okay, so thank you, Daniela, and apologies to everyone. Welcome to my, my kitchen. Uh, uh, this is the, uh, the best I can do. Uh, Daniela, it's great uh, that you asked uh, to uh, put together this panel. Uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure, it's an honor. Uh, it's great to be among friends, uh, uh, Daniela and Fernanda, since forever I've known their great work and which intersects with mine in a million ways. Uh, Antoine more uh, recently, usually over good dinners uh, with Stephanie and, uh, and Liz, although I'd heard about him and read his work for years because of all of my interest in the, uh, uh, the French legal system. Uh, finally, uh, Quinn, I really only know through his work, and yet 
through the glories of, you know, podcasts and YouTube, I feel like I know him really well, actually. So if you're not a stand-up guy, Quinn, you, you really do a good job of faking it. <laughs> so, um, okay, I, I'm particularly pleased to be doing this with Antoine because um, as it happens, and Daniela did not, I don't think, know this when she uh, proposed to do the panel, I actually already knew and appreciated Antoine's book a, a great deal. I had read it in French when it uh, first came out and then encountered it a second time when Ithaca friends and colleagues and my partner, uh, Liz Anker, were discussing publishing a translation. So uh, let me quickly lay out what I hope to do in the next few minutes. First, I'll relate very quickly the genesis of the book and what triggered me to write it. Second, I'll set out its basic methodology, its findings and arguments. And finally, I'll close by drawing some very quick parallels between my book and Antoine's, both to underline important points of contact, but also as a backhanded manner to bask in some of its glory. Okay, so uh, I first came to the issue of the ongoing European judicial appointments reforms over a friendly dinner with a European academic friend who I hadn't seen for a while. And as usual in those kinds of circumstances, you catch up not only on what you've been up to, but also on gossip from your respective circles. How's Daniela? What's up with Fernanda? You know the drill. So we're going down our list of contacts. How's Peter? How's Tamara? How's Zdenek? <gasps> Poor Zdenek. What's up with Zdenek? You haven't heard? No, I'm embarrassed to say I haven't heard. So Zdenek. A prominent young professor at a major central European law faculty threw his hat in the ring for his country's position as judge at the European Court of Human Rights. He makes it onto his country's list of three candidates put forward for election to the court by the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe. Okay? In accordance with the newly instituted Council of Europe procedures, the three are vetted by the newly created blue ribbon panel for candidates to the European Court of Human Rights, the advisory panel of experts, um, what I enjoy calling the APE, and I actually managed to get OUP to publish it as such. <laughs> so the, the APE brands one of the three candidates unqualified. For its part, the Parliamentary Assembly's own subcommittee on judicial elections basically concurs and tells the Parliamentary Assembly to choose among the other two candidates. That's it? Okay. <sighs> well, um, to make a long story short, the pace election occurs, and lo and behold, not, as, not only is Zdenek the obvious choice not chosen, but the vote winner is the third candidate the one branded explicitly as unqualified, poor Zdenek. Okay, so that was the first hook. Why on earth had the member states of the European Union and the Council of Europe, which had established judicial appointments processes that despite all appearances, all but assured themselves the unfettered power to designate their preferred judges to the European courts, and who had zealously maintained and exercised that power over the course of some years, suddenly decided to undermine their own capacity to continue to do so by establishing blue ribbon European vetting panels to second guess their own judicial candidates. And having done so, why would they then diss those vetting panels when they found one of the candidates unfit for high European judicial office? Second hook. As soon as I started looking into the debate regarding the need to establish these European panels in the first place, it was impossible not to be struck by just how boring, not to say inane, the debates really were. The same innocuous platitudes about judicial independence, the tired cliches of the importance of judicial quality, and on and on. It was so boring, so innocuous. Who could possibly care enough to go to the bother of pushing to institute such reforms in the first place? So that was all I needed to be intrigued. Why such reformist effort for such a tired and innocuous topic, especially when it ran counter to the member states' own apparent interests? And the only way to find out was to get on airplanes, 
to go not only to Luxembourg and Strasbourg, but also to a long series of European capitals to have discrete background conversations with whoever was willing to speak to me. Members of the main panels, current and former judges of the ECJ and ECHR, well-placed academics, knowledgeable ministerial and judicial figures, and so on. I was purring with research pleasure. Okay, methodology, findings, arguments. First things first. A short primer, I bet that most of us are actually quite, quite up to date, but short primer on uh, the appointment mechanisms to these European courts, right, which were both established in the 50s and both had one judge per state and renewable six-year terms. The ECJ procedure is the easiest, just appointment by common accord of the member states. Sounds like a veto system, but it was in fact opposite. No member state would challenge the judicial candidate of another member state, lest that member state play tit for tat for its own candidates. So the member states effectively could appoint their judges at will. As for the ECHR, look more complicated, but in the end, not terribly much more. Each member state would propose three candidates and the parliamentary assembly of the Council of Europe would choose one of them by election. Sounds like a combined effort, but not really. Each member state had simple mechanisms for conveying its preference among its three candidates and the parliamentary assembly almost always acceded. So why, given that these judicial appointments mechanisms effectively gave each member state a free hand in choosing its judge from the European courts, would the member states institute vetting panels to look over their shoulders? And why in 2009? What the hell was going on in 2009 that would prompt such a self-limitation? It made no sense. Well, as soon as I started researching those judicial appointments reforms, it became evident that they were not a standalone issue. The establishment of the panels was but the latest judicial independence and judicial quality and judicial councils and the separation of powers and judicial and gender equity and more. And as a result, the 2009-2000 dates, 10 dates are, are really misleading because if we contextualize the judicial appointments debates both thematically and historically, we find that this broader constellation of debates actually date not from 2009-2010, but all the way back to the early to mid 1990s. That is to say, when the great wave of former Eastern Bloc countries applied to join the European Union and the Council of Europe after the fall of the Berlin Wall. The seemingly judicial reforms were really an attempt by the established European member states to control the behavior of the governments of the new member states. After all, everyone had come to understand that the European courts had become major constitutional players, and almost half of their judges were about to come from east of Berlin. So the judicial panels represented, in essence, an insurance policy for the existing member states and for their aki. They were a mechanism for reviewing, which is to say policing, the new member state governments whose nature and behavior could not be confidently predicted. Okay, the second methodological thread is basically neo-institutionalist because the story isn't just about governments. Those governments had established a series of different institutions at the European level, including the new vetting panels, that quickly developed their own institutional interests and agendas that the member states were then poorly positioned to control. So for example, the panels repudiated roughly a quarter of all proposed judicial candidates, an astonishing number, given that the member state governments traditionally had carte blanche, including candidates from countries like Sweden and France. Oh, terrible. Even more, the panels took it upon themselves not only to publicly dictate the substance of the professional pro profiles that they would confirm, but also to suggest the procedures that the governments might wish to follow at the national level to select their proposed judicial candidates in the first place. Clearly, 
an institutional power grab that has led to both successes and failures. On the one hand, the panels have succeeded in acquiring significant procedural, institutional, and normative power at the expense of the member state governments that created them. But on the other, the governments have frequently fought back, resisting and even repudiating the panels more or less overtly, leading to a series of unseemly and even scandalous disputes, such as Purge the next story that first piqued my interest. Finally, the third thread is basically constructivist, because this is not only about governments and about practical institutional politics. It's also about ideas. It's about the developing professional and political ideologies that interact with the assorted players in the drama. So to pick the most straightforward example, the assorted European judicial debates and reforms have led to an utterly trite conclusion that judicial independence and the separation of co-equal powers when combined with the European courts need for quality judges and the status and authority they confer require that judicial appointments be removed insofar as possible from executive branch control and placed in the hands of independent institutions like judicial councils that are dominated by knowledgeable experts, especially judges and some academics. But this emergent orthodoxy, however unimaginative, is actually something of a constitutional revolution that ought to be recognized as such. After all, the mere assumption of the co-equal status of governmental powers, never mind that the separation of powers means checks and balances rather than a strict prohibition against judicial interference with political branches of government, however reasonable a political theory it may be, actually runs against the grain of the constitutional traditions of many and probably most European member states. So to try to unearth how this ideological shift had occurred as effectively as it seemingly has, I turn to what I come to call scandal theory, a rich vein of analysis drawn primarily from sociology and political science and anthropology, history, that discusses how scandals operate as an effective tool for advancing contested ideological positions in the guise of enforcing supposedly settled pre-existing and shared norms. And that's exactly what has occurred. To read the existing descriptions of European judicial appointment scandals, one might imagine that the executive branches of the established Western European member states had never played a prominent role in judicial appointments and judicial affairs, that liberal democracy worthy of the name could never exist, never mind thrive, should not elaborate formal firewalls exist between the branches of government, that only a college of elite figures at the intersection of the judicial and academic domains and of the domestic and supranational spheres could possibly manage the rigors and complexities facing the high European courts. For all the kernels of truth in such propositions, most are as a historical, never mind theoretical matter, demonstrably and self-servingly false. <laughs> What scandal theory helps us to see a, a little more clearly is that such propositions are loaded arguments, not reliable statements of fact, and that they've been put forward by particular players in particular fights designed to arrive at particular conclusions under particular historical circumstances. Yet, while this new orthodoxy places the judiciary at the epicenter of the constitutional order, most judicial, institutional, and academic commentators are strongly committed to the propositions, one, that European judicial authority and legitimacy need urgently to be shored up, and two, that this should be accomplished largely through judicial appointments mechanisms, including not only proper judicial selection standards and procedures at the national level, but especially proper judicial vetting panels at the European level. The clear assumption is that if judicial quality, competence, and independence were properly assured in the appointments process, then the legitimacy of the European courts and of Europe in general would surely follow suit. So even as European judicial power has become fully acknowledged, one might say fully realized and even leveraged, 
there emerges a concomitant anxiety over judicial legitimacy. And the best of the judicial institutions, such as the panels, and their academic and institutional supporters have been able to come up with to support the legitimacy of this new state of affairs is to generate what is in effect a warmed over rehash of professional qualification ideas. Judicial seniority, experience and quality, appointment by the European version of an independent judicial council, and so on. For all the recognized authority of the European courts, the new European legitimacy model thus follows the dominant paradigm for ordinary judges in national court systems in the civilian tradition. Between you and me, not terribly promising in the age of daily mail attacks. Okay, so that's it for the book. And, and to conclude, if you permit me, you tell me. Uh, 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 yeah, we're, you're out of time, but you take a okay, minute then, to wrap then up. Go ahead. Thank you. I, uh, no, please wrap up. Please wrap up. It's fine. I was just going to make a, a, a few bridges between Antoine and, and my book. Um, so, but... so then let's hear from Antoine and that's then we'll work on the bridges. I agree. Wonderful. I agree. I agree. Great. I agree. Thanks. Thank you, Mitch. Great. Okay. Um, thank you again for um, organizing this very nice uh, panel and um, indeed um, with many friendly faces. Um, so there, there are indeed uh, intersections, I guess we'll talk about it, between the, the two books and in particular the Conseil d'État, the French Supreme Administrative Court, which is a key player in both uh, stories of our books. So I guess uh, there are different faces of the Conseil d'État and, uh, um, and I, I'm going to talk about it a little bit. My, my little story as a starting point is, 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 uh, is that I was probably Five, five to seven years ago, trying to you know um, move to rather a more limited uh, type of research, and I was looking for just a, a, a little, um, a little research to undertake. And um, and at the time, um, the press, the media in France were talking about the fact that uh, you know a number of high-level politicians of um, members of the Secretary General of the Elysee of the Presidential Palace moving into law firms. And that was some sort of an intriguing fact. It looked a, rather limited in scope, but you know, there was uh, two former prime ministers who had moved from uh, um, to law firms and, 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 and top civil servants also. So the intriguing fact was first of all that usually in France, historically, it's the other way around. It's usually in the Third Republic, late 19th century, la République des avocats, the Republic of Lawyers, the legal profession was the breeding ground to get to politics and not politicians uh, moving into law firms. Uh, all the more intriguing that these politicians had no legal degree. They were moving into, poly, into, the, into law firms out of their political experience and their experience in drafting bills uh, in the executive. Um, and also, um, the fact that was also intriguing is that, of course, in France, we've always had forms of revolving doors. Uh, even the interventionist state had revolving doors from um, top civil servants moving into the strategic, the most strategic sectors in a way, defense or uh, public procurement, you know, um, the companies who were close to the public pro pro procurement. But in that case, what was new is that they were moving actually to law firms. They were moving to the consulting industry, also more, uh, you know, public affairs, etc. So there was something that was uh, uh, really intriguing. And then from that, you know, I started to follow the thread, the thread of the biographies, trying to bring together uh, one biography after the other uh, of all these politicians that ever since the 1990s, uh, all these uh, high civil servants that had uh, actually, without a law degree, uh, claimed that their experience of the state, their experience of politics was a credential uh, for them to act as uh, avocat d'affaires, as we say, as corporate uh, uh, lawyer. 
And um, progressively, it came out that, um, you know, those prime ministers moving into law firms were actually the tip of the iceberg. And there was actually, uh, under the radar, a number, a significant number of, of, um, of um, top civil servants um, uh, who had uh, moved into uh, law firms after 10, 15, uh, 20 years in service of the state. Um, so what I did, um, as I am uh, trained in field theory and I've been using Bourdieu a lot uh, along the years, um, is a sort of work uh, of collective biography. I've been trying to collect all these biographies, I mean, more than biographies, trajectories, professional trajectories, where they have moved, where they were coming from, and trying to put in series all these biographies not with the intent just to count, but to some, somehow map out the total social space, if you want, of circulation. Which part of the state do they come from? What is the sort of part of the state that is deemed marketable for law firms, that is deemed business interesting for law firms? And uh, uh, in the same uh, perspective, what part of the in which part of the private sectors do they go to? Which law firms, but also which uh, big companies do they go to? So the idea is to uh, progressively map out um, a field of circulation, a field of public-private circulation, somehow progressively um, portraying uh, within the state and within the business uh, sector, uh, how this field you know, somehow is, um, is um, positioned. Somehow, you know, to try to understand the new forms of collusive ties that have emerged um, er, uh, ever since the uh, 2000s, uh, basically. So what I've noticed is that, of course, historically, ever since the late 1990s, the number of people moving to law firms, these top civil servants moving to, to law firms has been increasing and increasing. What I've been seeing also is that initially they were essentially experts, experts in tax law, experts in competition law, experts in financial law, working in different parts of the state. But progressively in the 2000, 2010s, it's not only the specific experts that move into law firms for their expertise, but also generalists, also people who were, you know, the sort of, uh, um, you know, not, not with no specific expertise, but with um, an experience of uh, top civil, you know, top state affairs, and who were moving to play a role of lobbying, to play a role of, uh, uh, giving political capital to these uh, company, to these law firms, and in a sort of expertise of public affairs, very broadly speaking. And uh, what I've also noticed is that the number of people moving to the to the law firms follows very narrowly what I could call the neoliberal legislation. Each piece of new neoliberal legislation, if you want, by which I mean privatization of public utilities, rise of regulatory agencies, uh, outsourcing, public-private partnerships, you know, and there's a, a continuous series of legislation, of course, that is progressively transforming the French state vis-a-vis um, -vis the European integration, of course, but also vis-a-vis -vis a sort of more general liberal agenda. And as these legislations are passed, are voted in the parliament, they open more and more spaces of circulation uh, between the state and, and, uh, and the law firm. So what I've been somehow trying to map out is a new set of, um, a new pattern of relationship that, go, that um, comes along with the progressive conversion of the French state uh, to um, a, a new liberal, uh, uh, type of uh, uh, state, at least in its relationship with markets. Um, and of course, what is interesting here 
is the role that law law firms and lawyers are playing in this transformation. It appears that they are a key um, arena for uh, this public and private intermediation. So then I move in the book into zooming in into a variety of places where this public private um, encounters are happening um, under the roof, under the umbrella of law. First is making interviews with these lawyers. Um, and what struck me with the former politicians turned lawyers or former bureaucrats turned lawyers is the sort of sense of continuity that they give to their moving to the private sector, to the, to the law firm. They claim that they're actually continuing to, to, uh, uh, to service the state because indeed their client now is the state. Their client as lawyers is, um, you know, public utilities companies, segments of the state, uh, um, towns, etc. So uh, I'm gonna go quickly here, but it's very striking the sort of mirroring things that there is between the structure of the government and the, the, the departments of these law firms that have become progressively more and more specialized in um, uh, state expertise. And that's the second Zoom I've been trying. Not only the interviews with, with these lawyers and the sort of sense of continuity, um, keeping a sort of public service, but as a private practitioner, the second Zoom was law firms. To see that law firms um, that, that, you know, and the corporate bar that has emerged in Paris has not emerged as you know the usual the, the usual story says it a distance from the state but actually very close to this transformation of the state by showing that they were actually becoming the best experts of this this trans this new state emerging this new uh, regulatory state if you want and you know continuously offering to their clients new forms of expertise of the state you know of course uh, in terms of lobbying, in terms of compliance, in terms of constitutional law, and as and they they you know they're continuously producing new forms of expertise to show that they're actually um, uh, experts of the state. And of course, one of the best way to become an expert of the state is to recruit uh, former public servants and former members of the Conseil d'État, which is of course. Uh, not only a judge, but also conseil de l'état, counseling the state. And of course, uh, this is uh, one uh, of the things that the law firms show more is that, you know, they're having, they have their own member of the conseil d'état, they have their own member uh, of uh, the ministry of finance and former politicians, etc. And the third um, zoom is on the conseil d'état itself, because the conseil d'état itself in that story is also playing a very active role in some sort of aggiornamento, as there's my fellow Italian uh, friends here, uh, you know, a, a fellow, um, you know, transforming the, uh, the uh, administrative law into something that is very close to the French regulatory turn. And by this, doing a sort of doctrinal work, changing the key cardinal notions of public interest, general interest, and promoting a new notion of the, of the um, public economic and interest that is about promoting the state, uh, pr promoting the market, promoting free competition, a new public interest in organizing private markets. And as the administrative law is transformed by the Conseil d'État into something that is very close to that new state emerging, of course, the members of the Conseil d'État become, you know, a breeding ground for uh, new forms, uh, for new careers into law firms, into regulatory agencies. So I'm stopping here with two remarks in conclusion. Um, so uh, what I, what I've, uh, you know, from this very little entry point um, of a couple of prime ministers, and that story following the thread has led me in a way. Um, to somehow observe, thanks to, you know, the entry point of law, the entry point of law firms, 
um, a profound transformation of, um, I mean, the encounter between the French state and neoliberalism in a way, and um, the sort of um, repositioning of law in the, of law firms, but also of the Conseil d'État, administrative law, in, you know, at the crossing between market and, uh, and, and the state. So, of course, what I, I have a last chapter I, I'm not going to talk about, but it's about, you know, the democratic costs and political risks that are related to this blurring of the public-private uh, border and um, uh, the, the sort of um, difficulty to identify what the public interest is uh, today. Thanks for your attention. Uh, Fernanda, go ahead, please. Okay, so first of all, uh, thank you uh, so much, Mitch and Antoine, for writing the books, and <laughs> Daniela for inviting me and, um, and uh, to have this great panel. Um, I know many of the people in this, uh, um, in this group, so uh, I'd love to have more of a conversation, but let me say three things for which I start creating some bridges between the two books, and maybe that's part of what Mitch wanted to do. Uh, and let's see if they're the same bridges. Uh, the first bridge that I would like to create since we are at the American Society of Comparative Law is what um, uh, scholars like Annalise Riles and David Clark wrote about the, the kind of division between comparative law and social legal studies and how this long separation between the two somehow ended up uh, um, being uh, uh, creating, there was some rapprochement, especially through the work of Yves de Zelay and Brian Gart in Dealing in Virtue um, and other of their work that has clearly influenced both of our um, uh, writers today. And uh, the, the divide that was based on uh, uh, the comparativists being so Weberian and wanting to analyze so many areas and very much focused on European, US or Latin America and the uh, more social legal studies people that were much more into legal pluralism, non-European, non-Western legal systems. And, um, and so the divide was somehow overcome by this kind of Bourdieu turn of the legal profession, looking at the global liberal profession, the globalization of the legal profession. And so both, I think, Mitch and um, Antoine in their work, looking at the legal profession, somehow tend to overcome that, that divide. And it's uh, finally, we're getting sociologists and lawyers collaborating and comparative law and social legal studies is a thing, finally. Um, so the other thing is the legal profession and the idea of, uh, on the one hand, uh, Antoine focusing on these corporate lawyers in France, um, and uh, I love the term pantouflage, uh, which is, uh, reminds me of this leaper, um, but uh, that is actually, mm, it's a part of the revolving door, only one state, you, you move out of the public to go into the private, whereas our revolving door in the US, um, it's very much moving back and forth between the two, so they have repantouflage. And so this really, this interesting mapping of the, uh, the, com the legal profession is somehow, of the corporate lawyers is matched by um, uh, Mitch very close study of the biographies, the trajectories and the kind of judicial appointments through these two panels of uh, these two courts. Um, and, uh, and of course the whole scandal part, it's very intriguing uh, when uh, Mitch tells us about all the scandals of the various judges as the ones he told us about at the beginning. So this legal professional um, insight, it's very important for comparative law, not only because the, um, you know, the Antoine story is not only a story that is, is a French story, it's a story that you could repropose uh, for instance, in Silicon Valley, and how the lawyers of, uh, um, you know, Google's or big uh, firm have uh, somehow uh, used uh, the kind of turns to, to uh, technology and uh, the neoliberal rules against, uh, around technology in California, the, um, the, the idea that uh, technology became a primary neoliberal tool and the lawyers really exploited and entered that, um, that kind of new space uh, that uh, the, the state was creating for them, especially in the US. 
and in Silicon Valley. So let me go to the last point of uh, connection, which is neoliberalism. And, um, and I do think there is a difference between the two books. Uh, even though they both uh, address neoliberalism in their own way, I do think uh, that uh, there, there's two moments of uh, how they talk about neoliberalism, the turn of neoliberalism in which case he talks about how these two courts do represent, uh, um, uh, you know, there are institutions that have, uh, um, in, since uh, the 90s especially, instituted these judicial councils with the preoccupation that Eastern European states and Eastern European judges would be non-qualified, but also with the preoccupation that maybe we were going to get these socialist crazy judges, which ended up doing some sorts of reforms that were not really following the neoliberal agenda. We know from Quinn's work that, that it's very much um, the encasement of neoliberalism in by the uh, European Court of Justice and the European Court of Human Rights was part of getting the states on board with the neoliberal agenda. But, um, so, but Nietzsche doesn't really go further in his, uh, in his work on neoliberalism, stating that his whole preoccupation is really about the legitimacy of uh, um, of this judicial appointment. And he calls it a legitimacy and the social authority of the court and these reforms were to make sure that the court of justice and the EU would be, become more legitimate or would have more social authority. And therefore these, uh, these reforms are disappointment, uh, disappointing to, to someone who's interested in that. But I'm wondering if you're really concerned with neoliberalism, whether your, your starting point is a starting point that says, well, I want to democratize this court. I don't want so much this court to be more legitimate or more uh, socially, um, with, to have more social authority if this court endorses a neoliberal project uh, of Europe. And so uh, to me, the question is, in there's a recent paper by Defler and Moyne talking about democratizing the Supreme Court. And I'm wondering whether um, even the personnel, um, the personnel types of reforms that Moyne and Defler say are not really relevant. Those are not really important if you want to democratize the Supreme Court. What are really important are these empowering reforms, reforms that make these courts take less of, uh, of, um, of a role or figure out when they have to back up and leave this to the European Parliament or to uh, the Parliamentary Assembly. And therefore, we need to have mechanisms to disempower this court. It's not about their legitimacy or social authority. So I'm wondering how much neoliberalism is, is really part of your story, Mitch, um, and, and whether this personnel, the judicial disappointment, is an incredible, insightful, um, uh, insight on the profession, the judges of these two important regional transnational courts, but but they're not they're only somehow a very slight part of the story and doesn't even tell us where the power of the court is really in terms of maybe the court is really dominated by its presidents and we see Vasilius Kouras behind one of the reforms, but but the presidents play a much bigger role or perhaps. As Matilde Cohen has written, is about the personnel, the the, the 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 basically the bureaucracy that constrains these courts, which are ultimately courts. They're still, as Michael Ratzmatzen would say, there are school courts doing legal diplomacy. They're not courts that can be just civilian courts. They're courts that are still diplomatic courts. In so far that they're start, they are um, uh, they are. The courts that come from international organizations and they are not the, they have not the full fledged authority even though we know the court of justice call itself a supranational constitutional court uh, they they don't really represent constitutional courts uh, uh, for with the full democratic legitimate apparatus as to uh, antoine his, his notion of neoliberalism as he just explained it's much more present in the book and it's part of the story, but I'm wondering if uh, uh, in the new space that he has, uh, um, he has created where uh, the public is reconstituted through this private mechanism that are partly, and the state is basically part of this uh, um, uh, private great zone that opens up to corporate powers, 
the, the, um, the regulatory sphere. My, the question is, at the end, is, uh, Antoine offers some models such as non-compete agreements for lawyers, more transparency, anti-corruption measures, but it seems to me what it's missing really, it's uh, a, a kind of code of ethic or an ethical legal professional um, understanding that would make these lawyers uh, somehow uh, comply with deeper ethical norms that are very much needed for due to this transformation. And in the US, there's a rich literature, Bob Gordon, um, uh, William Simon, um, and uh, Will Michael Wilkinson at Harvard, they've addressed the, the, the importance, especially for in, corp in corporate law, tax, bankruptcy of these ethical rules because of exactly the new liberal concern that you have in mind. Thank you. Thank you so much, Fernanda. Okay, so um, Quinn, I look forward to the discussion over these things. Thanks. Yeah, thank, thank you so much to all the people involved and to the organizers and the people for showing up and dialing in and logging on to listen. Um, I really loved both of these books and I thought that they worked exceptionally well together. I think that I'm going to respond to them, obviously, less as a legal scholar, which I'm not, and more as a historian. And as a historian who's interested in something that connects the two books, namely, I think, a kind of a return to the question of the 1990s as a place where we can start to figure out the origins of what we now see as a kind of pervasive crisis of legitimacy in all things supranational and multilateral. Can we see um, places where we hadn't previously recognized sort of kernels of discontent, which have since grown and grown? And what I actually really like about both of these books is they're in a way giving credence to some of the critiques that usually come from the quarters of, that are often dismissed from the quarters of the so-called populists or Euroskeptics um, without endorsing the precisely the positions of, of of populist or Euroskeptics, I think both Antoine and Mitchell, um, allow us to at least understand or use those critiques as a way into seeing some perhaps flaws that were introduced um, or systemic issues that have produced kind of you know, understandable grievances over the years and decades. So I wanna start with Mitchell's book. I think that you know, as you make clear in the book and as you make clear in your comments, the book could almost be subtitled Managing European <laughs> uh, Eastward Expansion, right? I mean, this is really what, what comes through in the book is your story about the introduction of this new level of, of, um, of as you call it, an insurance policy of panels approving or disapproving the appointment of new judges to the ECJ or to the European Court of Human Rights is, as you're telling us, sort of above all, uh, motivated by a desire of the more established European powers to have a check on the appointments of new, newly uh, arrived Eastern European countries. That's, I mean, it seems to sort of, uh, by the end, read kind of as bluntly as that. So in this case, you know, the, the sort of the perennial question of who will guard the guardians end up being answered with, well, these two particular panels, right? The, the Article 255 panel and the, and the advisory panel on experts will sort of act as at least as gatekeepers into the, into the halls of, um, of judicial power. And that's a very provocative argument, clearly. I mean, what it seems to me you're argue, arguing is that in a way, what is often described as or understood as a trend towards juridicization in the 1990s was in fact a kind of a politicization through the back door, or at least it was an attempt to reintroduce kind of governmental power and specifically the governmental power of um, more powerful states against the less powerful newly arriving European states. And you explain how that's done, not just through this veto, which as you point out, can even be over, overridden and isn't always adhered to, but more subtly through things like um, adding in definitions of experience, which require that judges have been you know, active for X years, which automatically disqualifies a large number of people, including questions of linguistic competence, which automatically effectively dis either disqualify or drastically winnow down the number of people who can be actually appointed. And then in the end, simply 
deferring to the arbitrary act of, um, of definitions of, of, of judicial quality, which leave wide open um, the, the chance to do the kind of thing that you opened your remarks by describing simply the dismissal out of hand of an otherwise apparently qualified judge. The, the most telling case for this that, uh, that linked the kind of intricacies of protocol to the sort of larger capital P populist um, uh, politics that we've been looking at in the last few years is the case of Václav Klaus's personal advisor, right, in 2012. I, I will hopelessly mispronounce his name, but Alex Paychal in 2012, seemingly totally qualified, not, um, you know, not accepted by the, the panel, seemingly because of his connection to Václav Klaus, who is, for those of you who don't know, it's hard to miss him, you know, extremely loud mouth, vulgar, climate denying, brutally Eurosceptic, appeared at the Brexit Party's conference um, either earlier this year or last year. And so in this case, it seemed to be really a kind of a personal grudge against the Václav Klaus type character, which led to the disqualification of the appointee who is associated with him. And it's a moment like this that it must be said, one suddenly becomes sympathetic to the kind of populist Eurosceptic position, right? I mean, this seems like a case of a clear tweaking of the rules, a bending of the rules to keep out someone who is, should otherwise be allowed in. So if this is true, if what you're describing is the case, then how far can we take this? I mean, do we have to rethink the whole story we have about the early 90s as this high point, as you put it, of democracy through law as an utterly cynical uh, rhetorical ploy? I mean, are, are, we, are we sort of saying in effect that, the, that the, this process of juridicization was always an attempt to simply retain control for, you know, original six or strong Western European powers against the East? Or would that be going too far? If it's going too far, then where do we draw the line between the sort of cynical deployment of a juridical language and a kind of a, a more earnest attempt to use law for democratizing purposes? I mean, it, it seemed like quite a cynical story to me that you told, and I'm fine with those kind of stories. But I just wonder um, whether or not there's also space to, to tell this in a slightly different way. And then lastly, I would ask whether or not you think that you can transpose your insights beyond the space of Europe. So I was thinking of um, the, the current travails of the appellate body at the WTO. I mean, is there, is there a similar issue there where, where the attempt to create a kind of layer of juridicization to depoliticize things ended up producing a kind of arena for potential judicial activism as perceived by more powerful actors in this case, the United States looking at the appellate body, which proves that in a way, the, the juridicization move was always kind of a false one. It was just kind of a smokescreen for, you know, great power politics anyway. I mean, can we, can we tell your story elsewhere too, if we want to start retelling the story of the 90s to the present? Okay, to, to Antoine, I mean, this was, this was just a fascinating um, insight that you gave us. And this is being a session of the American Society of Comparative Law. I think it's interesting to think about your case comparatively, right? If you think about American narratives versus, in this case, French narratives, it's interesting to see how we can, the corporate law world is sort of the equivalent of the Wall Street investment bank in the American political class. And the idea that um, you can achieve sort of neoliberal outcomes, not through deregulation, but through a very open and explicit re-regulation as you're showing, suggested to me, for example, the, the, the story that Rawi Abdullah tells in his book, Capital Rules, about sort of French social Democrats being important agents of neoliberal European policy because they thought that through managed globalization, you might be able to come to a kind of a, a better outcome than through what they saw as you know, totally unregulated globalization. I mean, when you see you know, Ségolène Royal and, um, and Francois Hollande, both sort of spending time at law firms. Um, Dominique Strauss-Kahn is a business lawyer. Right? It seems to be that there, it seems to me that there's a very important story here about the specific legal nature of um, the pursuit of the neoliberal project in the French case. And it, it's, it begins to appear as almost like a, a particularity of France at some point. And I wonder if I'm getting that 
that correct that correct one thing i was reminded of i was trying to find a quote from david kennedy was he has this great quote somewhere about how the real message of international economic law a la john jackson is not any abstractions of rule of law and so on but really just it's a message for lawyers to begin polishing your cvs right that actually what this doing is producing a huge new stratum of job opportunities and sort of possibilities for professional advancement and i think that you know what you show very clearly is that 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 has been you know exploited to the hilt you use all kinds of evocative language which i love the sort of corporate lawyers as the kind of champions of this new public private space which you also call an extraterritorial space or a black hole or a blind spot even these terms come up in the final chapter of the book and all of these things were achieved because, of course, of the aggressive um, pivot towards the use of EU competition law, competition policy in the 90s and 2000s, and then the willingness of the French state under a variety of political uh, leaders to go along with this. I mean, some of the, the figures that you name are extraordinary, the number of privatizations that happened in single years in the 1980s and single years in the 1990s. So I think that, you know, you. I was also reminded of Desiree and Garth. I was glad that, that Fernanda brought that up. So I was wondering about this, whether or not um, we can read the two stories together, right? The, the Mitchell story and the Antoine story. We, do we see um, external things external to France, such as the Eastern European accession, which plays such a large role in Mitchell's piece in kind of motivating the um, the perspectives of corporate lawyers or the corporate lawyers simply sort of short term opportunists who are just sort of looking places to plug in their expertise and get and get their contracts and leaving. Is there any kind of a larger way that we can think about their um, like they appear as kind, they appear as kind of useful idiots in a way for the neoliberal cunning of history, it seems to me, in that they don't set out to say we want to gut democracy. It's just that acting, um, you know, in what the process of gutting social democracy is simply so pro profitable that they'd be foolish to pass up the chance, right? But is this something that they are sort of ideologically motivated to take part in them, themselves? Does that even matter? And then finally, I suppose, because you've written at length on, on this, you know, with Piketty and uh, most recently in Harvard for Harvard University Press, what is to be done, right? Is there any way of, of clawing back accountability over this black hole, blind spot, extraterritorial space? Is the European Court of Justice as the kind of guardian of the competitive order recuperable as the guardian of another kind of an order? Or is this something that is, that is locked in and baked in and we would simply have to design new institutions altogether? I think I'll leave it at that. Thank you so much, Quinn. Uh, this was great. So clearly we have enjoyed these books very much. I wanted to, um, to inject a couple of questions, one per author, and I'll be super quick um, uh, so that we have time for discussion, but I, I can't pass this opportunity. Uh, so um, to Antoine first. So Antoine, I was, um, uh, I was reading throughout your book a certain sense of nostalgia for, for the state, the public spirit of the state, as the book calls it. And uh, it resonated with me because I have the same thing. You know, I've spent the first half of my life in France's uh, southern neighbor, Italy, and I understand what the state can do, right? So the state was, in my youth, a form of emancipation. The uh, fancy public schools were, for me, a way to uh, definitely emancipate myself. They were perceived as a, a uh, as, as an instrument of growth for the people who had no means to begin with. I loved that part of the state and many other things. Um, however, today, nostalgia for the state uh, becomes more complicated as a, a, as a univocal message, right? So uh, I wonder why at this point in time you decided to, to present it as a monolithic concept. Maybe you have explained it in other books that I haven't read as well as this one, but the book felt nostalgic in a way that I, that shouldn't it be more nuanced? Why is this nostalgia of the state as a concept, as an ideal now that the state itself is in trouble. 
uh, the other so, well, the, the question that I had for for Mitch uh, has to do with the uh, first of all a f phenomenal diagnosis and linking of what happened with the Berlin Wall falling but what comes later is actually quite intriguing what I loved is the metaphor of the hall of mirrors and I was wondering if we could do this today in other words sort of talk about the books and then at the same time reflect on what we are doing and watch ourselves doing this watch you doing this um, at this point um, why this kind of reflection now uh, and uh, uh, I leave it at that uh, so we can maybe collect a few remarks from the audience and then give it back to the authors or would you like to respond how about that let's take a couple of questions from the audience and then uh, and then we move to replying to the um, to the discussions oh, oh Francesca Francesca Bignami please thank you sorry sorry about that um, uh, yeah, so I, the, the question is for the second book, because since a lot of these reforms seem to be, or sort of this change in the legal profession seems to occur in the shadow of the law, so all the deregulatory law that occurred in the 90s and 2000s, um, and these people from the state acquiring expertise in the different areas, and therefore being able to sell that expertise after their experience in the state. Can it be dialed back now relatively easily um, because of the traditional dominance of legislation versus other forms of law uh, in a civil law, sort of, and especially in the French system? Uh, so give, if we think that Europe is in a new phase where it's retrenching on this liberal agenda, trying to build a more concerted kind of industrial policy because of the, uh, the changing geopolitics, do you think that this trend can be dialed back um, with a, a new kind of economic policy. So that's the question. Thank you, Francesca. Any, uh, okay. So while uh, others collect their questions, uh, let's uh, proceed with uh, maybe Mitchell's response. So great. So um, a couple of things. First, I'd, I'd like to apologize for the length of the book. I can't believe you people seem to have actually read was... the damn thing. I mean, I, I, given the amount of time, I had already read Antoine's book, and yet it took me a long time to reread it. Um, so I can only apologize. I, I should have said, you know, first chapter only or something, right? Um, so um, I think I may start... Um, a little bit with uh, Daniela's um, question as a way of linking all, all of the others. I, I agree that there is something um, problematic about both books that I'm quite sure that Antoine and I are conscious of, which is um, in Antoine's case, a, a distinct flavor of um, of affection for a past that uh, that do we really want to recover? That's one, and two, um, the question of um, in my book, why would I want to contribute to a possible um, valorization, legitimization of the European courts in the first place? And I think that both of those questions are totally legit, right? Um, so um, I, I can't speak to Antoine's book, but I, I'm gonna speak to, to, to my own. Um, I, look, the, the first goal of the project was to try and understand what the hell had happened, right? And to give a plausible interpretation of that process. That's point number one. Point number two, and, and the book hits you over the head with it, is I don't believe in unitary uh, explanations. I think that there's a whole mess of layered explanations and that they are layered on top of each other. They conflict with each other. They're flat out contradictory of each other all at the same time, right? So I absolutely do think to go back to, um, uh, to Fernanda that there is a neoliberal component to this and linking it to, to Quinn um, I don't think that that neoliberal component is just a matter of power politics um, between the West and the East, right? So I do think that there is, in fact, 
Um, and it was one of the primary, it was in fact the first thing on my list of, of bridges between our two books um, is precisely that we are historicizing what is in essence an ongoing current phenomenon, right? So it's sort of super recent history, right? That's one. Um, and two, that we do absolutely place the 1990s in a, in a, in a seat of particular honor in, in the genesis and progression of, of, of that process. Um, I absolutely think that part of that, um, of taking the 90s seriously, if we want to put it that way, um, is the, the legal component of the, of, of the period, right? Um, the, and we can scoff at it now and say, oh my God, if you look at Schleifer and Laporta and all of that, that their own conception of law and the judicial role is unbelievably impoverished, right? And yet it was unbelievably influential, right? So uh, we need to have an account that includes that in the in the description of what's going on. So it's not just a matter of the West trying to dominate the East, although surely it includes that and protecting their own interests and all, surely includes all of that. But it's also, and here's where I think that the two books also come together. I think that when you get into the nitty gritty of this, what's fascinating is precisely that the, the the micro stories of the different players and of the different barely visible to the public um, institutions in which and through which they're, they're working are actually working over time to generate conceptual transformations, ideological transformations that are actively working to reconstruct our operative idea of what the state is doing, what it should be doing, who should be managing it, how they should be going about it, how these institutions and these players should relate to others so that there is in fact a whole, um, a whole neo-institutionalist story of, of institutions elaborating both their own power and at the same time, elaborating an ideology in that process that actually comes to, to influence the system in some fundamental way. And you end up with a kind of feedback loop that is incredibly strong. Now that leaves open the question of, um, you know, why now and what are we gonna do about it? Um, I, um, I guess the sh short answer is um, first to, to recognize it and to, to flag it. Um, and then I think we both have critiques. They are, um, they're different from each other, but they're clearly related. We're both very um, uncomfortable with the reconstructions as they have occurred. Um, and uh, it is also fair to say that, you know, there is something somewhat odd about people on the left now reduced to going the state and wouldn't it be great if there were actual legitimacy in the courts? It's, it's really, it's pathetic. Um, um, and at the same time, amusing. Um, uh, I, I think that both stories are sufficiently corrosive that um, I, I don't honestly think that either is actively involved in reconstructing the state as we understood it in 1979. I'll, I'll leave it at that for now. Yes, and fun, please. Oh. I just, I just wanted to, to. Uh, there's no. I don't want to take time away from this, but I, um, I think you took my question in a direction <laughs> that I, I didn't really intend. But, but thank you. It was very, a very interesting reply, nonetheless. Well, thank you for all these comments and um, and enjoying the time to to read to read uh, both books and um, and I, I I shared with Mitch you know the the sense that our books um, share methodologies and and uh, particularly that that interest in history micro story and uh, 
in in uh, and narrating a transformation and on on that i think there it's it's yeah. good to see the um, um i don't know if it's the, the new normal but it's for us too there's a common a common a common um way of writing and and constructing um objects and i think this is this is this is also very interesting uh but i wanted to there are many questions but taking probably from the last one of daniela in a way it's the most it's more uh, unsettling in, in in questioning you know what is, is it in my uh, approach um and probably i'm too french in writing that but at the same time i mean i'm writing at some point that we should forget um nostalgia yeah. and i'm not sure i'm completely good at it um but my my um attempt here is to think about um, the publicness of the state not just the nostalgia of the state per se but the question the notion of uh, of the state um, and i bring in the last chapter you know um, the theory uh, of um, michael walzer and the what he calls the art of separation which somehow is drawn from pascal the french philosopher you know things that tyranny comes when one sector takes over the other one. When the border between the public and the private is blurred, then it's not just any national border. It's not just any legal border. I think the border between the public and the private, so in a way, the publicness of the state puts at, I mean, puts in question the notion of democratic citizenship. You know the notion of autonomy of a public sphere where decisions in the name of the public are taken so i think um, what i'm trying to do here let's rethink that public private border as not as not just being about you know more efficiency of a state of public action or um public private partnership but as you know what is the democratic stake of uh, guard, uh, having a good guardian, I mean, of, of, of you know, guarding that border. And uh, so I'm not saying, I, I'm not necessarily have great solutions, you know, Jessica was saying, yeah, why, why not reverse, uh, change the laws, um, you know, somehow deepen that, that sort of a field of public private. Um, I, to, to a certain extent, I think we should think of legislation in that sense. You know, I think any legislation creates, um, you know, professional, um, you know, new professional opportunities and strike. And what I'm trying to do trying to, to show here is how this neoliberal legislation creates a lot of law firms, uh, professional opportunities to blur more the public private uh, uh, bordering. So in that sense, we sh yeah of course we consider more the impact of a legislation at the same time of course France is deeply embedded in the European Union and part of my story and it probably relates also Mitch is writing is that being embedded in that uh, European project and in particular you know the big thing of the European project being the market and the competition and one of the key element i think of the european union is that it has no notion of the public and the private it was actually built on questioning the relevance of the public private division uh and tension law is you know what has unsettled more this french notion of the precisely because he was considering you know public utilities company exactly would consider private firms and so in a way, as France is deeply embedded in the object that is continuously undermining the, the, the there is here something um, that is probably um, to be thought at the European level. How could we think a notion of the public and the private, the European level? I mean, I leave it open, but um, with PKT, we've been thinking of, you know, how we could think of public European public goods in a way in that sort of attempt to push for a reflection on the, on that sense. So then very briefly, if I may, um, uh, also on what Quinn was saying, French socialists, and in a way I agree that they're, they're market socialists, you know, 
um, uh, ever since the, um, uh, the 1980s, precisely because they, with Mitterrand have chosen uh, the priority of the European project over the, you know, the transformation of uh, French uh, society. Um, but I'm trying to see, to, to point at here is that in a way, this transition takes both socialists and conservatives in a way. Um, you have a new type of uh, uh, administrative elite that comes with these regulatory bodies, agencies. They all somehow, everybody's redefined as regulator. You know, the commission is a regulator, a, a minister becomes a regulator, uh, regulatory agents, regulators, judges are regulators. You know, everybody's producing that public to which, you know, on which law firms have to, uh, that law firms have to influence in a way. And uh, in the, um, you know, in the English, in the American edition of the book, because it was initially translated, I've added a, um, a section of Macron because I think Macron is is interesting in, you know, precisely ignoring the, I mean, wishing all the public private uh, the public private divide and wishing to ignore the left wing right divide. In a way, his project is that it's beyond the left and the right. Uh, it's both public and private. And what is interesting in Macron is that in a way it's the entering into politics of the field that I'm, decri I'm describing. How at some point these regulators, you know, with you know all this, they some at some point think we don't want to go through this old party politics, enter into the political field directly, and turn our you know our some sort of public-private project into a political program and in a way Mac is a sort of a, I'm not saying the end point of the process but a very important step in the process because yeah. entering into politics of the regulators type of uh, paradigm if you, if you want and um, with no left-wing right-wing clear um, um, no affiliation with a continuous promotion of public private partnership um, and of course with a uh, um, ministers that are all so on the fact that they have regulatory experience in a way. Um, so the way that 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 is um, that is also element of uh, uh, of the of, of that story. I'm going to stop here. I don't want to be too long. Thank you so much, uh, Antoine. We have a question from Boyan Bugaric. Hi, Boyan. Hi, Daniela. Thank you. So I uh, I have a quick, a quick question for Mitch. Uh, Thank you for a fabulous presentation. I'm trying to think about uh, two, connecting two issues. One with uh, your fascinating Eastern European story, Zdenek. And uh, by the way, I happen to know Zdenek, another Zdenek, who is uh, scheduled to be uh, at the 255 committee next week. And also I happen to know another candidate who was rejected by the committee very recently. Uh, but I, I was thinking about connecting this story with the point that Queen made about you know the new you know, populist nationalists. So I guess when you're writing the book, you know, there was already Orban in Hungary and, you know, and, uh, or not really, but now you're having a different Europe, you know, and imagine, so I'm, I'm the question for you, what would happen, you know, that for example, let's have a fictitious case, you know, Orban nominates his very eloquent justice minister, Judith Varga, you know, uh, for the position of the judge of the court of justice, you know, how, because, you know, when, when Zdenek was rejected in 2007, you know, this was not time of the populace. So how would that affect the whole infrastructure put in place? Thank you. Absolutely. So Boyan, first of all, I tried to chat you to say hi, because it just, I was just excited to, to see your, your, your picture there. So, um, so listen, uh, uh, the first thing is that the, the book tries to make clear from the very beginning um, uh, with regards to this question, two things. First, that it would be a uh, historical anachronism to think that what was driving these reforms was um, concern having to do with uh, Fides or, or you know, law and justice or whatever, right? So the historical um, record is that these transformations in the judicial appointments process predate um, those, those, uh, those historical events. Okay, that said, 
we're in a different place now than we were then, right? Um, and so there is absolutely no question that a good number of the struggles that have occurred over the last few years between the European judicial institutions and the governments of uh, assorted countries in Eastern and Central Europe, and for that matter, with France during the Sarkozy period, right, are struggles of, uh, uh, shall we say, problematic executives um, who are uh, playing games of one kind or another in the judicial appointments. And look, any self-respecting authoritarian uh, executive is going to want to try and control uh, a judiciary that might control it. I mean, I think that's just self-evident. Um, and unfortunately, we know that Orban and so on are more than proficient enough to have understood that lesson. Indeed, it was one of the first things that they tried to institute. So um, there is no question that the um, institutions that have been instituted for other reasons, right, can be leveraged, right, can be leveraged um, to do, uh, to resist um, those kinds of problematic behaviors. So I, I have no doubt about it. And indeed, if, um, uh, in all of the conversations that I had with all of the players involved, um, they're, a lot of what they're doing, or at least a lot of what they imagine themselves to be doing, is precisely that, right? But that said, that's only one layer, right? It's only one layer. Um, and at the same time as they're doing that, um, they're doing all kinds of other things, right? Um, they are uh, undoubtedly interested in protecting against that kind of behavior, but they are also, and even quite, quite consciously, promoting different kinds of, of visions about what Europe should be. Um, and uh, uh, they're conscious of it. They are not interested, actually, in having Eurosceptics get appointed. And they are as aggressive about that as they are about um, fighting problematic candidates from country X or Y, right? Um, problematic because they're tied to political power of a type that is problematic, right? Um, so that, that would be my answer is there's no question that, that actually this can be used to protect, but it's depressing that that's what we've come to Right. Uh, in theory, if there was going to be a, a, a reimagining of um, the judicial space in a manner that would either be weakened in a way that Fernanda was suggesting, um, or that would be improved in a way that we might imagine, the idea of rearguard actions to protect against Orban as the sum total of what you might be able to accomplish is kind of a bummer. Hence the title of the book. <laughs> So I, um, I, I think I was instructed to stay uh, sharply within time. Uh, so I think that we should uh, allow people to say goodbye to one another and to say closing words. I want to say one closing word. The books are amazing. Okay, I have enjoyed every page and indeed I have read the whole thing, the whole things. Uh, so, uh, and it was quite a pleasure because among other things, uh, the authors are amazing writers each in their own right okay so um the it's the american society of comparative law here and so we all keep thinking of what these debates these stories so rich and so profound tell about uh, the system we are living through um so uh thank you for the provocations this is just the beginning of reflections over what you guys have put forth uh, i really 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 appreciate it and uh, uh, thank you so much uh, Hope to continue this. Thank you, Quinn. Thank you, Fernanda. It was wonderful.